And what a pleasure to see you. the recording. Got it. Uh, got it. Okay, I'm going to click on got it. And what a pleasure to see Sue Guy from Scotland. My goodness. Uh, the, the fun we had at the master's program, the undergraduate program. You know, I still think of all the students and faculty I met. And my gosh, you know, 16 years. That's family. I always felt that everybody was part of my family. And, you know, I'm in touch right now, Facebook and so many, so many people. It, it's life giving. And uh, it's propelling me at this point in my career, which is starting anew again this year, 2022. In the age of COVID, I wish I could see you all eyeball to eyeball, but at least I have a few of you on video. And you know, it's so great to see Stacy and Sean and Brendan. I mean, it's just amazing. And oh my goodness. Anyway, we will do with what we do with technology because I want to mix serious business with a bit of fun as well. You know, rubble to refuge. We're in a climate crisis right now. We're in a building crisis. We have cities that are being torn down. We have infrastructure roads that are being torn down. We have subways that are being built. We have new roads. I mean, we have a government that's gonna put another highway 413 right through farmland and Holland Marsh. Uh, Amazon boxes in Duffins Creek, wetlands. I mean, we have a lot of stuff to think about as landscape architects. And I think the profession has never been at a point where it could be so proactive, show so much leadership as we have right now. I am inspired by all the potential catastrophes that are hitting us. Today, I'm talking about rubble to refuge. It could be from desert to refuge. It could be from starvation to refuge. It could be from no housing to refuge, social issues, the whole nature culture conundrum. How do we bring ecology into the city planning process again? And you have to go back to Design with Nature and McCog when he was trying to deal with ecological processes to shape city form. And you know, we've got so regularized, we've got so legalized, institutionalized, and while we tried to break down silos individual work, we have more silos than ever before. I just finished a three hour meeting with Interior Hydro this morning on a new butterfly pollinator garden I'm designing in the Meadowway in, in Scarborough. And uh, my goodness, people just aren't talking to each other and nor do they understand the bigger ecological picture. And I think this is where landscape architecture comes in, but I also think we are doing so at our peril right now because I think that we need to think of our academic programs again, always sufficient in science, ecological science, soil science, climate science. Uh, my view, I saw this happening when I was a director, we lost soil science, we had budget cutbacks, we lost physiology, plant physiology, we lost dendrology, botany, we had limited number of plant species with plant identification, uh, and the cultural history of cultural form is down to a few few hours. So actually I started a five-year program for many years in landscape architecture like architects have. And uh, we, because of budget cutbacks, we had to reduce it to a four-year program. I'm just saying though, I think that as we grow in the profession, everybody who graduates, it, it isn't the end. This is the beginning of the learning process. And I think this is why it's so incredibly interesting right now to see a landscape architecture become involved with climate change and urban resiliency, food security, housing for the homeless. What I'm seeing now is the, the potential for the involvement. Let's start off with Tommy Thompson Park. Uh, I'm mindful of time, it's already 109, but I need to talk to you about this. Whether it's a design of a residential home in Rosedale or a farm or a resort or an urban waterfront lake fill like Tommy Thompson Park. And you see now the first slide is the metropolitan Toronto region. And Tommy Thompson Park is the lower right, 800 acres, it's bigger than Central Park in New York City. It's one of the, if not the largest urban park 
in the world. Bigger than Central Park. Nobody realizes this. 800 acres, 400 of land, and 400 of water. And then you see the Don River system, East Don, West Don. And then you go through the waterfront and there's Toronto Islands and its lagoons and warm water estuaries. Then you get this 156 acres of interior place further west. And then the whole Lakeshore Boulevard, Lakeshore Parks to the mouth of the Humber River. And then the Humber Shores development, you see High Park. So why is this important? If you're designing a backyard in Rosedale, or you're designing Tommy Thompson Park, ask yourself, where are the birds coming from? Where are the butterflies going? Where are the insect populations? What's the mammal population of Toronto? How many fox? How many beaver? How many otter? How many deer? How many opossum? How many birds? 370 birds at Tommy Thompson Park. I began this project in the 70s, actually, when the spit was being built, Tommy Thompson Park, Accidental Wilderness, and there was not a blade of grass. Three to 400 trucks a day bringing the rubble from 1880s homes from Cabbage Town, bringing in concrete blocks that had been ripped out of buildings, industrial buildings, and dumped without control without control, three to 400 trucks a day, 20 to 30 cubic yards, I'm dealing imperial now per truck, imagine it. And on weekends it was open and I would bicycle ride. And I'd say, my God, this is incredible. We're doing this into the lake. And what did I find? 14,000 nesting pairs of ring-billed gulls. It was like the Everglades and I'd stop my bike and they'd all fly away. I'd be a meter away from the nests. 14,000 birds would fly away. I get on my bike, they all come back again. Dump trucks going by, the birds were there. Fast forward, and I was doing this all through the 70s. I have photo documentation. Early 80s, same thing, but all of a sudden there were trees developing, small, small trees, but poplar. Populous in Tatum, Carolina poplar. Populous Granny Dentata, Big Tooth Aspen. Populous Tremuloides, Trembling Aspen, Quaking Aspen. And I said, where, where are these trees coming from? And then you start to think, oh, seed sources. Where, what are the prevailing winds? Where is the seed bank? And then you start to look around and you look at the climate charts and the southwesterlies, the westerlies, the northwesterlies, whoa. Toronto Islands. There we have it, the seed sauces blowing in. And of course, the grasses, the grasses, and our lovely native plant, the dandelion. Dandelion, I call it. They, the most, uh, what a plant. It takes over everything. I love it. Can't have a better plant than dandelions. Don't tell that to the pests and you know, the weed control companies. They want to herbicide everything. I want to grow dandelions. So let's just move through this scenario now, which we're not, 1986, um, uh, with EDA Collaborative. And uh, RFP, Request for a Proposal, came in, actually it was 1985. And I said, hmm, this is interesting. I want a master plan for Tommy Thompson Park. This is politically loaded because the previous plan presented by the Conservation Authority filled in all the wetlands, we need ball diamonds, we need manicured lawns, we need picnic pavilions, we need a aqua marine facility, maybe a Disneyland, maybe a historic boat museum. And you know, the public were kind of interesting. And Friends of the Spit with John Colley said, this is bullshit. We really, this is a treasure we have here. This is an urban wild. And the plan, aquatic park plan was defeated. So what do they do? They bring in a landscape architect as the, the punching guy. <laughs> and say, hey, take on this job, it's too hot for us. And a bunch of firms have submitted proposals and we get the letter, you're successful. Ah, okay, you're successful. So you arrive on the site again and the bulldozers are moving soil around and you begin to look and you see the A 
horizon on the top a little little bit of soil with some grasses uh, some yarrow developing some solanum but what do you see you see bricks oh cabbage town 1888 bricks what are bricks made of well the evergreen brickwork site now the don valley brickworks Bricks, what are they? They're burnt clay. Whoa, clay, soil. Oh, isn't that interesting? What else do you see? It's the landscape architect's paradise, actually. You know, you're told to do a planting plan. You know, you put a lollipop tree in the ground and you put your silver cells in. And, you know, you know what's happening in technology today? A lot of it is nonsense. If we really understood the basics of what plants need, you don't need silver cells. You need proper soil. You need proper drainage. You need proper soil nutrients. You need soils that develop mycorrhiza. So, you know, we're adding a lot of money to budgets because we have we are being told by industry this is what you need to help trees grow. Um, that's another story. We could talk a lot about that. It's like manufactured play equipment. Uh, you got to have a playground at every school, and it's manufactured out of plastic, and it's red, yellow, and green. And you say, "I've done my thing for kids." And yet you need to go back to what kids like to do. They run and jump and skip over rocks and they, they play in the soil and they build things. And we give them a static piece of equipment that lasts for 20 minutes of interest. You slide, how many times do you want to slide down the slide? But go to Trillium Park and see how many times kids want to climb the bluff. Four hours at a time instead of 20 minutes. Anyway, go back to this slide. You see, you're getting me on a bandwagon already. But what else do you see here? You see concrete. Ah, concrete. Hmm. Where does a where does a lime come from? And what else is in concrete? Well, aggregate. Well, where does the aggregate come from? Glaciation, the Caledon Hills, and probably this case. The brick, on average, take one year through climate action to break down into clay soil. When the concrete block is on the wave edge, in one year, like a mortar and pestle that concrete is broken down into pebble beaches. Unbelievable, right? So we're now developing a new soil horizon. What else do you see in this? You see, oh, reinforcing bars. Well, where does the iron and steel come from? And what happens when iron meets oxygen? It oxidizes. So we're now we're getting into the pH of the soil. And I began to think about this and I said, hey, if this is happening on its own, all these trucks are bringing in this soil, you can see what's happening day after day, five days a week, three to 400 trucks a day. And I'm on the site watching this. I go, what is the future of this landscape? Look at this color of these soils. You can see the brick, you can see the iron. We also had a lot of sand dredged from the harbor alkaline sand on the west of the of the spit and the east was mostly rubble that turned into clays and uh, you see now this drawing from the early 90s so this is the west and this is the the sand part that th this is the outer harbor is supposed to be toronto the great a new outer harbor it never happened so you can see how the vegetation and the early 90s was taking over primary pop poplar. Today, it's primarily uh, black locust. The beaver have eaten the, the, uh, the, the poplar. So now we have black locust. And we actually are finding today in our latest studies last year, 40% of the vegetation on Tommy Thompson Park are species not native to Ontario and they're called invasive species. Uh, if you deal with First Nations people, they would never use that term because every plant has a purpose. And my friends, when I took my First Nations friends here, they said, oh, we use this as a poultice for burns. Every in quote unquote invasive species had a medicinal name. It had a function. Whoever created the earth created these plants and they have functions and they happen to be responding to different climatic conditions. 
So this is a big issue now. You say we've got to protect our ravines from the invasive species. Well, what is the invader? Maybe the human is the invader, not the plant. The plant is just doing its thing. Anyway, so the importance of this slide, this is almost build out now, uh, 1992, is I want you to look at the cells on the right, cell one, cell two, cell three. Today, if you go there, you'll have thousands of botic ducts, pintails, scalp, some botic geese, snow owl. This is an incredible bird habitat. These were the cells that would be to be filled in by the planning department, make it ball diamonds, cricket fields, what have you. And when I arrived here, these were 45 degree slopes and trapezoids as engineered holding ponds that take the dredgeate from the Don River and dump the dredge material, the sediments from the Don into these holding ponds. And then of course you would then fill them up and cap them. And uh, I began to think about this. And you know, this whole Portland used to be a thousand acre wetlands in the 1920s, one of the biggest wetlands in the Lake Ontario system that was filled in. You can see all the fill, the sewage treatment plant, the, the ship channel. You watch what's happening in the Don now as they, they try and um, re redirect the Don River. In any event, I looked at this and I said, I was on the Great Lakes Wetland Committee at the time, and I said, no, 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 no. You can't just fill this in with an engineering approach. Let's design these cells as wetlands. And in my book, you'll see some of the conceptual drawings of how we can reshape the landscape and deep water ponds and the proper slopes for uh, emergent vegetation to take root. Um, logs for turtles to rest on. Lake Ontario is a, a cold lake and it gets subject to upswells. So very cold water comes to the surface and the fish and reptiles need refuges, warm water. That's why Tommy Thompson is so, uh, the Toronto Islands are so important. So these became warm water refuges. And if you go in here today, the turtle populations, the, the birds, the fish that come in here, we actually have collars that monitor the fish populations coming in and out of Tommy Thompson Park. It's amazing to find fish coming from Kingston, Ontario and St. Catharines coming to spawn and rest and, and swim around Tommy Thompson. It's really what we don't know, making the invisible. Nadia, you and I talked about this years ago, making the invisible visible. And of course you begin to see dynamic action of, of siltation, sedimentation, and these embayments are closing in now and you see all these dead trees Right now we have 60,000 nesting pairs of cormorant, okay, black crested cormorant. And the Ford government said, we ought to shoot them all. We said, no, no, no. This is part of the natural ecological function. And we were successful in preventing them being shot. Notice this pond in here is called the Triangular Pond. It was the only remaining pond uh, on the site was to be filled in. I said, no, no, it's a warm water refuge. And this whole area down here, in 1998, I got a contract from the Conservation Authority and I hired graduate students from the Landscape Research Group to do a plan for the toplands and wetlands in that area and that's now built. You'll see that in a minute. So this is what you're confronted with as landscape architects, a construction road. By the way, it was great for rollerblading, uh, it's getting it beat up now, but I bicycle right here at least once or twice a week. It's a wonderful place, but this was, what you found, the red osier dogwood, uh, the occasional alder coming in, the occasional poplar, embayments. And then I'll go through the plan I developed. I, my original pencil drawings I have on a slide, but I'm gonna show you what we do when you put it into a computer. All my pencil drawings are now sort of sterilized. Uh, Toronto is up here. This is the baselands of Leslie Street. This is prime snake habitat, coyote habitat. There are two dens of coyote on the site, each with about 10 coyotes. They're radio monitored. They leave Tommy Thompson to go up to Collingwood, Christian Island, down to Barry, down through the Eastern beaches and come back here. Wildlife in the city, nature and culture and urban wild. You go down to the narrow part of the neck, and you see the cell number one, which is now built and converted into Portland. Cell two is now built. Cell three, we're 
got to look at that timidly because that's where the otic ducts are. These are the flats, the uh, uplands, the toplands, and the triangular pond, and the embayments, the cormorant on these peninsulas. These are fabulous places to go out, especially with late afternoon. 5, 5.30 at night, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of bicycles with their lights on for people getting the sunset over the city and Lighthouse Point. And these are raised points. These are variegated mounds, decanted drainage systems. The whole basis of the work I was doing here is conservation by design. If I can control drainage, uh, detention areas, retention areas, purposely designed for wet areas, design slopes, hot slopes, cool slopes, wet slopes, dry slopes, understand wind vortexes, how you have low pressure areas and you're grading, so seeds will have deposition areas. How do you design drainage ditches so seeds will fall into the wet areas and germinate? You know, you don't do a planting plan. All you do is establish the table and let nature create the menu. And we don't teach enough about that. We teach a planting plan. We're gonna superimpose our thinking on the land rather than let the land speak to us as the land wants to and should. And here are my drawings, you know, little sketches. You sit down and say, hey, the wind is coming this way. We've got a, a steep slope here, irregular grading, a permanent pond, intermittent pond. Hey, a, a cold slope, internal drainage. All of a sudden, you're creating habitat for red osier dogwood, for birch. The things, it's amazing what happens in one year. Here's the wetlands, you know, a deep pocket, five meters, islands. I studied a lot about ducks and the need to create these little wandering spaces for ducks, their privacy. That's where they nest. You got to think about how ducks reproduce. You got to put your head in the mind of the tree, your mind in the shrub, the mind in the I'm working on a bond swallow restoration project now. You got to put your head into the mind of a bond swallow. How the hell does it see an insect and fly immediately to catch the insect? You know, so we got to think about internalized nature, the prevailing winds, and you see the regular grading and the stuff you can create just through grading. And this is what happened that shoebox, your engineered shoebox, that's cell one. This is uh, this year. Uh, so just the end of last year. And this habitat with ducks and beaver, wildlife, it's just, it, I'm, I'm so happy to see how this has evolved. Okay, we have Phragmites coming in now instead of the normal cattails. What do you do with Phragmites? Well, in, in Europe, Phragmites is used for straw roofs. You would know about this in Scotland, Sue. You know, when we think of Phragmites as our invasive, horrible weed. Well, you know, it's also a great habitat for red-winged blackbirds. I know because I've been attacked and Trillium, building Trillium Park. Red-winged blackbirds and uh, grackles can be kind of vicious. With the University of Guelph Landscape Research Group, we did the grading plan for the, the top lands and the flatlands. And we're down to 150 millimeters of grade differences. So the water decants gradually down the hill. You see where the poplars are? Look at this. Oh because we created wet zones and then dry zones, hot slopes, wet slopes, all happening. I didn't spend a dime except for grading. The planting plan has come in. These are the embayments. You can see the cormorant apartment. These are cormorant condominiums and uh, they love to build on top of each other. Huge layers of guano underneath. I mean, the stench is unbelievable. You canoe out here and you're dealing with uh, couple of feet of guano. But you know what's happening? With rain and our snow, the guano is now, it's full of nitrogen, right? It's seeping into the soil. We have plants like Rumex coming. We actually think we have a plant that's native to Tierra del Fuego in South America. That Rumex is now found at Tommy Thompson Park. How the hell did a bird bring up a Rumex seed from South America? Tell me. And black locust galore, this is the triangular pond. And you see the Phragmites here and occasional cattail around the edges. That's a beaver. The beaver have had a house here for years. The black crowned night heron, the loons. We had canvasback duck 
For the first time in Canada three years ago, a pair of canvas back ducks came. Oh boy, they reproduced this this year. We now have canvas backs. Now, how have people reacted to all this? I had a year of public meetings, 10 round tables, 10 people each, several meetings, 100 people at a time, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, landscape architect at the other end of the table, all doing our thing, trying to get from people the intuitions about nature. And I have to tell you, it was exciting because people said, you know, we would like a natural place. Hello, aquatic park, manicured lawns, lollipop trees. People said, no, no, no cars. Can't we just walk in nature? Now look at the rubble. That rubble is one of the sources of creativity. People love, kids come and they build. Adults come and the first thing they do is build. What does that mean for design? You gotta be able to design what people can manipulate. People can do their own things in the landscape rather than just being given more objects, more playground structures. Hey, look at that rock. Look at these, look at this. Look at that little castle. Look at that little place for gnomes to live. People carry their bike. You got cormorants flying by, you got sailboats. Oh my God, the people love it. Then of course the view to the city, 10 minutes from downtown, city of four million, five million, six million people, one of the greatest wildlife refuges in the world. And this is the thing. When I bicycle ride out there and I go back to the 70s, there was nothing here but drainage ditches. And then by the 80s, I saw these line of trees, a poplar. And populous deltoides. And then I said, my God, Andre Lenote who was here with these straight lines. How did this happen? And of course, it was the drainage ditches. And look at this urban forest today. This is last year. And uh, I, to me, I go out there and I, I get so emotional to see how this place has developed. Imagine now as landscape architect, 50 years from now, 50 years from now, what is this going to be? How big will the trees be? Okay, fast forward. So let's see, 130, we're good. Competition came up for Ontario Place. And uh, this is Trillium Park here, eight acres. Here's the IMAX, is Eb Zeidler who just died, his, his pods. You're gonna talk about that in a minute. The Budweiser, the old forum was destroyed. Cirque du Soleil goes here. The Therme Spa is going on the West Island. All those silos will come down and the trees will be cut down. Uh, the commission to, oh, rubble to refuge. Look at that asphalt parking lot. Please, dear sir, make it into a park. And uh, I did a lot of sketching on this, actually, trying to figure out. And ask yourself this as students of landscape architecture. It's called Ontario Place, not Toronto Place, Ontario Place. How do you symbolize Ontario in a waterfront landscape? And I couldn't help but think of my Guelph experiences, the Guelph Drumlin Field, the Peterborough Drumlin Field, uh, Sandbanks Provincial Park, Pebble Beaches, the Niagara Escarpment, Marines, Eskers, Cames, Ravines, Riverine Systems. And I said, God, you know, that landscape of Ontario, can we, through metaphor, create a, a, a geologic history of Ontario with First Nations and how they lived in that landscape? And what were the vegetative species that they covered? You go to the boreal forest, and the Carolinian forest, and the St. Lawrence hardwoods, the St. Lawrence ecosystem. So the ideas begin to germinate, you know, you're, just, you're festering with ideas. And I can go through all the drawings and work with Adrian Gruz a bit at West Eight. He was with us for about three months. And uh, together, he, he designed the, this pavilion here on, on the site in a metaphor of spruce trees. And the idea of this park, eight acres, was to have the upper ridge, which wind protection, as well as being the esker. And down here, Land's End, Sugai, England, Land's End, the Trumlin, the view over Lake Ontario, Rochester's this way. Then the Carolinian forests, 
and the glacial edge, the big bulldozer, the Lake Iroquois, right here. Big Aspen Grove, the Populus Tremuloides Grove, the Hemlock on the north facing slopes. Carolinian forest in here are the Buckeye, the Red Oaks, Tulip Tree, Osage Orange, Black Gum, this is Sylvatica, Sassafras right here. Experiment, I didn't know, I didn't know. But you know what? After three years, they're all surviving. They're thriving on this harsh water climate. I'm doing more planting this coming spring. Uh, Magnolia cuminata, we're gonna try the magnolia. I have one here right now, it's not doing so well, we're doing more research. And then OLA asked me to design the Huff Garden, which is testimony to my very good friend, Michael Huff. Eb Zyla was a good friend. So here's the Huff Garden. And children, when we did the public participation here, just like Tommy Thompson, people said, keep it wild. Man, don't bring in playgrounds, make it natural. Tulip trees, Michael Huff, his garden here. Promenade, benches sitting on, on top of Esker ridges. The Moraine Bluff, the world's biggest bulldozer. I have a small fishing cottage in Georgian Bay and I always wonder how the hell the pine trees grow out of no soil. And these rocks, I live on rocks in Georgian Bay. The drawings. And then built, this was built. I, I spent three months in the quarry in Dwight building this and then using GPS technology, measuring every point and then doing 3D imagery, photo scanning and put it into the computer. And five weeks, every rock was transported from Dwight brought here, metaphor, the cave. The, the waterfall on a 2% slope when it snows, the pads drip down and makes their own waterfall. The Stonehenge crevices, their children play environments. They love this all in layers and all with the sand beach and then the pebble beach, the metaphor of our Lake Ontario shoreline. The lawyers went crazy. The insurance people went crazy. They had said, you're out of your mind. You're gonna be sued till you're bankrupt. In four years, we haven't had one accident. I said to the lawyer, please go away. Insurance people get lost. I meet with parents here in the summer. I'm here every day because I supervise maintenance. The parents are climbing this thing. They're teaching their children how to climb. The children are learning how to use their, their balance. And they play with the rocks, they build things. And then of course, the next day we put the rocks back there again, Pebble Beach. And then we were invited with a competition, I'm mindful of timing now. This is the marina. It's been underwater for two years with the high water. So here we now landscape resiliency. And I prepared a new plan, a new plan, putting everything up in boardwalks. I used to come here in 72, my sailboat would park right there, Kelly's Irish Justice, <laughs> Justice Pub. We would dance to 12 o'clock at night on the tables drinking beer. It was a hub of activity. It was unbelievable. The IMAX, the pods, all of these pods empty now for the last 20 years. This is now being revitalized. Everything is elevated and pedestrian in winter now we can go through a beautifully designed solar covered walkway. The ships become active for ferries from downtown Toronto, cruise ships, transient moorings. You'll hear more about this. You're gonna read the newspapers this weekend. I entered the competition for the design of Interior Place and uh, international competition, dozens of firms entered and uh, my consortium is uh, awarded the contract. What a way to start 2022. And, uh, and then from Ontario Place, I got involved with the idea of the forest. You know, if, if Trillium Park is here and we have active nodes, and they, instead of a marina, let's call it Ontario Port, a real Lunenburg of Toronto, and the Western on the West Forest and other activities here. Right here is a BMO Stadium, the host of the FISA 2026 World Soccer Championship. Think of those connections that are possible. But I got involved with, this was the Dragon Boat 
wall that was built for the International Dragon Ball competition, 26 million bucks built, new wall here, built to a higher standard. But you see that faint outline and this faint outline, that's a 1912 breakwater, 1912, when the city was only 300,000 people, they built a breakwater. God, how do they get the money? So here's Ontario Place. And this is my plan now for the Humber Bay. And this new breakwater that's been built for the dragon boats is 600 meters. This is now 2000 meters. The old breakwater is in here with the expanding population, much more protected water space. The breakwater, existing breakwater is here. And you notice it used to go right through to the Humber River, but natural process is filling in all the areas behind the breakwater. From here to here is only 11 inches of depth. Imagine, they're all coming from the Don River, the easterly flow, this is a vortex in this part of Toronto. Lake Ontario flows from west to east down to St. Lawrence. And this section of on Toronto is a vortex that goes from the Scarborough Bluffs and goes westward and deposits on Toronto Islands and now is filling in to this area, the beach and the Humber. I did a study in 2002 to deflect the sewage treatment plant, all this polluted water. The Toronto water wanted to deflect the polluted water. It's to, you clean it up by dilution. All right, that's the way you handle pollution now. You move it further out into the bay. So the deflector arm came out. Of course, this is a carrying place trail. Think about it. One of the projects I'm working on right now is virtual simulation. Think of us all 1647. Where were you? August 31st, noon 1647. You were on your way from Lake Simcoe to Lake Ontario. What were you wearing? What did you rest? Where was your food source? How did you move? Uh, we're doing this right now, virtual reality. It's now 1747. The English have moved into Babby's Point. They put up their fences. They've cut down the trees. They see these strange people walking with different types of clothing. Stay off my land. It's private property. 1747, conflict. First Nations come down here for fishing. It's now 1847. First Nations are now on the Six Nations Reserve. New Credit have their place. The Potawatomi are up in Moose Deer Point. The Cherokee and Cape Croker. The Mohawk, the Walta have their reserve. Oh my God, you know, we put people into little cubby holes. Carrying Place Trail has been the original trail that goes right up to Kleinberg. They can still go up there to this day. Go to McMichael, you can get on the trail. From Lake Simcoe, you could be the French explorers in the 1600s and St. Me and the Green, the Hurons. You can go up to Christian Island, Beausoleil Island, and canoe right up to Thunder Bay, the Voyageur. They, what a history that people don't even talk about. Go back to Tommy Thompson Park now, rubble to refuge. And the new landscape where landscape architects can shine particularly infrastructure. So people looked at me when I presented this plan, Habitat Islands, no bridges, just let them be. Tommy Thompson, don't do a damn thing except grade them. Martin Goodman Trail, let's rename it to an Ojibwe name. It's so crowded, it's so narrow, let's build a bridge and connect the Martin Goodman Trail all the way along here and new beaches, clean beaches, internal waterways, a ceremonial center for First Nations with virtual reality, understanding the fishing and heritage. Palace Pier used to be here in the 1920s, Sunnyside Pavilion. This is all cottage country now. I call this country, it's just like the 20s when people didn't have the money to go up to Lake Muskoka by train and be picked up by their private boat. People don't have the money. They have immigrants, 60,000 Afghan families coming, 60,000 Syrian families, you name it. We need cottage country for people who have few means. There are 150 food banks in Toronto. I'm gonna to talk about that in my ending, but I also think about art and landscape architecture, the detail of the beaches, the habitat islands, the virtual reality center, the Gus Ryder Pool, Boulevard Club, the 
First Nations ceremonial park, uh, canoe rentals, kayak rentals, no big boats, affordable, and the arm. And I began to look at this arm again, and I began to think of the wave action coming in from the Southwest. And here's a sedimentation that's taking place all by itself. You don't need a landscape architect engineer. Nature is doing its thing. Now people walk. I love people sitting up here on this with their Apple computers sitting on top of the breakwater, 1912 breakwater. Look what's happening. It's actually fested, uh, fetid right now. But, you know, people make just like Tommy Thompson. They're making their own little paths. It's an urban wilderness. The Western forest. Oh, my God. One of my drawings, recent drawings, I began to expand from the Palace Pier formal promenade to more of this kind. I do a lot of pencil work. And so the habit, the islands, the canoe, kayak rental, and uh, the dunes, you know, there's little nooks and crannies. You can fit yourself into dunes in the age of COVID, small places you can just immerse yourself into in the windbreak from the West and views into the city. And then I thought, well, you know, this is the gateway to the city. Uh, why not have something really dramatic, not just a lighthouse? Because I did have a lighthouse here at one point. And I planned to play with around crystals and stuff. And I began to think of the Portlands when I went there recently. And when you move soil, if you dump soil, it automatically forms a, a cone, right? That's what, you know, go to a beach and let the sand run out of your hand and it forms cones. And I said, damn. Why can't we just create a pyramid, step pyramids, step landscapes? And that's, that's in Yucatan, right, Maya? But you know, maybe we need like Smithson and the jetty and Salt Lake and Utah. Some really, we, I think we're missing opportunities in the Portland of dealing with land art and whatever this turns out to be. But also, in essence, creating this kind of environment in downtown. And I donated this rock to Ontario Place, Walk Gently on the Land in French, and it's already there. And I also want to get one in Ojibwe. I want to end off now. And I went 47, we're pretty close. I'm working on um, a project in Ontario Place with Terea Heska. She's a Master of Landscape Architecture student at the University of British Columbia, graduate of Fanshawe. And uh, her thesis is on urban agriculture. Now we think of urban agriculture and we think of community gardens and green roofs and things like that. The reality is that we need food every day all year long. There are 150 food banks in the city of Toronto. The poverty rate of Toronto is appalling. People can't afford houses. You probably saw the incident in New York City, the fire that killed 19 people. We have people, 15, 20 people living in a, in a house in Toronto. They can't afford food. They can't afford shelter. I think landscape architects have to be involved with nature and culture, the sciences and the humanities. Um, Terea's work is investigating the pods of Ontario Place. We met with the Vice President of Research yesterday at University of Guelph and the Dean of Agriculture. We've also been in touch with her thesis to the Ontario Science Center to move a Guelph campus, an adjunct facility to Ontario Place, to which those pods, about 22,000 square feet of empty pods, vacant rooftops. We have water for vertical agriculture. We have solar power for production of electricity. Working with the scientists at the University of Guelph, the big thing right now, supported by the federal government, make Toronto a center of, of food security research, has to deal with advanced fermentation research, creating animal plant material into protein instead of relying on beef, cattle, and global warming issues were sounded by that. Plus the fact that our prairies are down 30% in food. We've lost most of our blueberries in British Columbia. We've lost our agriculture in Arizona. The Colorado is running dry. 
We lost a pecan in California. They're cutting the trees down, no water. The Sonoma Valley, the droughts in Brazil, the loss of bananas in Ecuador. You name the things that are happening globally with desertification. And you start to think about as landscape architects, the future. By the way, I meant to mention this about, I'm talking about infrastructure again. The Humber Bay Islands, I said to myself, where am I gonna get all the fill? And uh, it was announced by the premier that there's gonna be an arterial line subway from the science center down to exhibition place. And five and a half kilometers of that subway are gonna be underground. It's a subway. I talked to the Metrolinx engineers, they have to get rid of 8 million cubic meters of soil. How do you get 8 million cubic meters of soil from downtown Toronto up to farmland where we're gonna dump it on farmland? So I said, hey, I can take 8 million cubic meters of soil from Humber Bay. Now, I just got an email yesterday from Metrolinx, very interesting. We're in the process of letting contracts, we wanna keep this in mind. So there's landscape architecture and infrastructure. Ontario place infrastructure with urban agriculture, vertical farming, solar generation, fish farming, perhaps, at the base of Ontario place. Not nets or anything, just by creating habitat. So this is where I am right now. And I just think that at this point in the evolution of the profession, uh, I, I just can't help but be inspired. It makes me younger every day. You wake up with a spark. You say, four o'clock in the morning is nothing. Come on, baby, let's get it going. <laughs> you know, we got things to do. And I'm serious. I, you know, I'm not getting any younger, but I got things to do. And I want you to have that same spark about this profession can add juice to your life. And uh, I always like to think of the saxophone player. You know, if you're playing on the stage, and you're suddenly you're saxophone playing suddenly becomes work get the hell off the stage because if it's no longer fun, if it's no longer play, time to get off the stage. So let's have fun and let's play as we think of the future. And I think that's it for questions and answers. You know, like you get me pumped just thinking about this. So what do people have to say? Thank you.